Hi guys! I just got back from a trip to New York. I was visiting my daughter and it turns out she lives about a 10 minute bus ride from the Met Cloister Gardens. And this is a museum built to house medieval treasures and uh, it has cloister gardens which show how gardens were done in monasteries. And some of them were fantasy gardens, some of them are herb gardens and flower gardens, just for uh, spiritual refreshment. But the Middle Age era was a wonderful era for gardening. I mean, they had it, a lot of our modern gardening is, is based on the principles. This is, I'm gonna read you a few snippets from my pamphlet as we go through my pictures. And uh, as you'll see, I look like a medieval peasant and my daughter looks like a medieval princess. The true, the tree cloister garden was where the cafe was and we had tea and cookies while we enjoyed the gorgeous blooms and fragrance. And this was just a pleasure garden. And uh, I think that they prioritized spiritual refreshment and enjoying nature. Here's a, a golden finch enjoying seeds on a thistle plant. My daughter captured that wonderful picture. But in a monastery or a cloister, um, it is a rectangular or square open air courtyard surrounded by passageways or uh, an arcade. So the arcades are shady and the gardens are full of sunshine and they just light up the flowers and it was truly truly a magical experience i could personally have sat there for a very long time but it's nice to get up and look around and, and look at things close up as well and see the different varieties of plants they have about 400 species of plants that were known and used in the middle ages in the different cloister gardens and uh, again this was the tree cloister garden and here we're moving on to the bonifant cloister herb garden and they hold specialized herb gardens and plants in the, the most specialized herb plants in the world and the foundation is a list of, of 19th century edict of emperor charlemagne naming 89 species to be grown in his estates. So they have a, a basis from the Middle Ages. Although there's not a lot of documentation apparently on gardens, but uh, I think this museum does an amazing job. They have beautiful artifacts inside, but I have to admit we spent most of the time outside in the gardens. And as you can see, most of the gardens have a central point where there's a water feature of some kind. There were a lot of uh, woven types of garden structures as they would have made at the time. But these cloister gardens were a place where they, the nuns and the monks could enjoy nature without leaving the monastery. And in this case, they could grow herbs and uh, edible plants. A lot of times there were fruit trees. They left seed pods up because I think, you know, in those days, of course, you didn't go to Home Depot. You gathered your own seeds. And here is a beautiful spalier tree. And the gardens were full of fruit trees. This one happened to be more formal. And there's my daughter standing under a fruit tree looking like a medieval princess. But they were just just magical, just a, so, such a beautiful place to spend the time. This last cloister garden is the Judy Black Garden in the Cooksa Cloister. This might have been my favorite. It was the largest cloister. and had a gorgeous fountain in the center. And they had some tender plants in terracotta pots, which are moved inside during the winter. I think a lot of us do that as well. But this was the gorgeous fountain. And this whole museum and complex was built in 1938. A lot of the treasures were donated by uh, wealthy patrons of the Gilded Age. But they're just beautiful. And a lot of the architecture is from monasteries around Europe. 
We did make a wish, but I won't tell you what it is. We want it to come true, but this was sort of a wishing fountain and the trickling of water was very relaxing. As you can see, the pollinators were enjoying these purple bell flowers, but there were so many different varieties. It was it was hard to pick a favorite. We were just mesmerized by the by the beauty of the blooms. I think this was a very good time of year to go, but they did say they have planted these gardens so that they have year-round interest. And these gardens uh, are supposed to evoke the idealized gardens and landscapes of the Middle Ages. So they were just really spectacular and you were surrounded by this medieval architecture. You felt like you were in a, a really in a monastery or even a castle. And there were lots of different types of flowers there and vegetation. There was a lot of uh, variety in the foliage. They were just really beautifully, beautifully planted. You can see some lilies popping out from this, this side of the garden. And there were trees in each corner. So as you neared the corner, the gardens got shadier. So it was both shade gardens and sun gardens. They also had an orchard, which we didn't see. We did love this beautiful Dara. This was a gorgeous plant as well. But these are uh, a lot of poets and artists used botanical themes in their art and their writings. And as you'll see later, I'll show you one of the famous tapestries. This was a dark pincushion flower that my daughter and I were in love with, with some euphorbia and possibly amimagus there. I might be wrong on that. But there was there were a lot of thistles, and um, there must be a reason for that. Of course, the, the um, birds were delighted with those and the pollinators. Here's some globe thistle as well. It was just such a, a riot of color and blooms and really gorgeous. And the architecture really set everything off, very ethereal. We really were able to forget about everything during our visit to these beautiful cloister gardens. And here's a dahlia. Just all kinds of plants were popped in here or there. And like I said, the people that take care of these gardens do an amazing job. I was in love with this euphorbia, which was spotted all over this particular garden. And this is where there was a shady spot in the corner. So you can see it's still beautiful. Their shade gardens are equally as beautiful as the sun part of the gardens. But we were lucky to have a beautiful day as well. And if you get hot, you go under the arcade where it's shaded. Of course, there's a lot of mythical creatures included in medieval art. And there were quite a few uh, statues around the garden. This is under the arcade. I loved how they did this. They took cuttings of blooms and put uh, names to the flowers so visitors could come and, and see and identify the flowers they were enjoying. And that is just a beautiful wide angle view of the variety of, it's almost like a cottage garden, but it's just a variety of and mix of plants that's just so pleasing. There were uh, pathways that crossed through these courtyards so the visitors uh, could enjoy just go through the whole garden and get a closer look at the beautiful plants and then when we got uh, it was hot and humid so we came in to cool off and look at the beautiful medieval artwork and these were some columns I thought was beautiful this was an atrium it was bright with some ferns and of course a water feature in the center absolutely gorgeous and then we stepped out onto a terrace. There was a terrace overlooking the Hudson. And in the corners, they had these beautiful container gardens with a, a mix of plants. Some were evergreens, many were succulents. But um, I was 
enthralled with this part as well. I love container gardening, but it was very beautiful. Again, with the terracotta and the cool stone. And here's a close up of uh, one of the pots to show you the variety of succulents that was mixed in here. It was just gorgeous. And this is the other corner of the terrace. And to be surrounded by the medieval architecture, it was really a, just, just an interesting experience. We really felt like we stepped back into the Middle Ages when we visited the cloisters. There's so much to see. I can definitely go back each season. I would love to go back every season and see what's blooming. And here's an example of some of that architecture. Looks like a fortress. And, and it was such a beautiful backdrop for all the gardens. And of course, the artists of the time always depicted beautiful lush forests and botanical, botanical interests behind uh, mythical creatures. And it, it was just, this one, this tapestry is one of the best preserved. It's a unicorn resting in a forest. And it's pretty famous. You probably recognize it, but it was just amazing artistry. So thanks for joining us and seeing our vacation pictures. I hope you get a chance to go to this beautiful, beautiful museum in Upper Manhattan.